uh, I'd like to welcome um, Barry Bragg, who's the chair of the, the board, um, to the meeting this afternoon, and Alistair Pearson. Um, and if I could uh, invite you, Barry, to um, to uh, make your initial presentation, and okay. then we can address the debate. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, thank you for the, the workshop um, on Tuesday. Uh, the purpose of the workshop was to share with you the information behind the design and reconcile that design uh, relative to the project brief and to talk about the, the way forward. Uh, we received some excellent feedback that we will be taking through to develop design. Uh, the other opportunity was to give you an update on the program, the risks, the value management that's taken place, and also um, the forecast uh, risks around cost. So uh, the purpose of this recommendation is just a short recap on some of the key slides um, to inform the resolution. So just summarising again the roadmap so in December 2019, the Council approved the project brief and proof of concept. Some of the enabling works were uh, approved in 2020 and they have been completed. The PCSA contract uh, went to market and um, B6 Wattpac or Katui B6 Wattpac were appointed for the uh, pre-contract services agreement. On the 22nd of June, there was a concept design presentation um, after uh, several meetings on the 12th of August, the council resolved to uh, reset the project and um, <laughs> lay out the design principles that we took through to uh, prelim design. On the 9th of December, we presented the statement of intent, um, the assurance program and the authorities, which were approved. And the council also approved the early work strategy which was designed to, as a mitigation to the program and cost risks that we are seeing with the project. The prelim design um, presentation is an opportunity to be fully informed about the prelim design and give us some feedback on the, the material matters that we need to take forward to develop design. So in a moment, I'll get Alistair to recap what we will be doing during developed design, but at a high level, uh, there will be some extensive stakeholder engagement around the interior and exterior design. Kortui will be engaging with the market around the construction methodology and getting further cost and program updates, which we will bring forward to a presentation in April around developed design, and then we will receive a final bid and proposal from Kortui in May, which we will be presenting with a recommendation to Council in June. Alistair? Cool. You just uh, pretty much told the slide really, Barry, but anyway, I'll, I'll just <laughs> press it again. Just for, for just a clarity again, the design principles that were established at concept design stage have now been completed through the preliminary design stage. We are moving into developed design. Within developed design, we will continue that detailed stakeholder briefing. We get a clear understanding of the, each of the building elements now. We have that nomination of materials and systems that will be worked on through that developed design phase. And more importantly, we've got the coordination of the design amongst all of the building elements. So this is about clash mitigation now about the actual physical build of the structure. And again, just to confirm that our market uh, input has been ongoing throughout this process and our engagement has been on ongoing throughout this process, which has informed the methodology and the construction timeline. The, uh, we're also confirming availability, availability of materials, but also uh, capability within the market and what the uh, subcontractor market requires as the preferred model to market. Um, we are finalising the construction methodology, and again, that evolves throughout the developed design phase. Uh, the techniques and the programme are part and parcel of that process. And the early works uh, strategy that was adopted in, in uh, December last year is underway, um, with um, the closure of the tender for the ground improvement work is this month, with uh, an expectation that starts in April this year, so with a handover of the site in March this year. So. 
work is underway to mitigate uh, and give some surety towards um, risks that we've already uh, highlighted through the briefing sessions. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk through three slides. Um, just, just wanted to sort of say that the south is obviously that top right hand corner. Um, this image uh, highlights the form of the arena itself within the, within the precinct and the designation. You can see the extent of the uh, structure itself, which is the skeletal structure that sits around the building. This, is, this has been part and parcel of the, what's been developed in a, in a great deal of detail throughout the uh, preliminary design phase. It shows you the extent of the ETFE roof, which allows the uh, light into the field of play, which allows for turf growth. And just uh, as, a, as a marker, the transitional, the transitional cathedral is in that northwest corner, which is the bottom left. And, um, and noting that the finishes and level uh, and detail that will, will be applied to the external of this building is not yet defined, but it will be worked on throughout the DD. Next slide, please, Barry. A further image just giving you an indication from, uh, from Latimer Square, uh, looking from that northwest corner, uh, looking up Madras Street and across to Hereford. Gives you, uh, this gives you a real, this is a true life model of the building and how it sits within the designation. It shows you the size and scale, and it's showing indicative public open space and alignment with the Madras Street and the Hereford Street uh, works that have to be done. Next slide, Barry. Uh, final slide from me. Just a good indication of what the interior looks like uh, with the roof structure and the, and the ETFE giving that uh, uh, accessibility to natural light, airflow through the, um, the uh, access vomitories which are on the four points of the, uh, of the facility. Um, this in this uh, northern stage pocket is indicated in the bottom left hand side which is where our concert setup would be would establish plus our 5,000 extra seats so that's that grey area just to the bottom left and then to the, that, the, the field of play itself is the, is the largest it can be it's the international standard field of play and on the right hand side you can see a few people mingling on the western terrace and, uh, and which is the western corporate <laughs> terrace so Gives you a good feel for what the building looks like. The, the two white blobs, which are in the um, northeast corner and the southwest corner, are where the uh, large-scale replay screens will be uh, uh, placed, which is, gives people full vision of replay across the facility. And that's me. Uh, Caroline? All right, thank you. Um, so obviously we had a pretty detailed session on Tuesday. Um, but the important part of where we're at at the moment with um, design is to actually reconcile where the design is with what the intended uh, outcomes were at the beginning. So the investment case, the strategic case, and those strategic venue design fundamentals. Uh, so a brief recap there. Um, the design um, fundamentals, a multi-use, genuinely multi-use covered arena, uh, rectangle field of play with natural turf, uh, a minimum of 30,000 seats, so 25 of those being permanent and five being temporary, uh, and a minimum of 36,000 in concert mode. Uh, the ability to deliver corporate and flat floor events, uh, quality acoustics, a level one U-shaped concourse and a northern stage pocket, and toilets on the ground floor concourse with food and beverage uh, on both the ground floor and level one concourse. The strategic design fundamentals. So the venue needs to be commercially viable. It needs to attract events, attract visitors to the city, uh, and the design must consider the future of events. So we must be able to be nimble, be agile, be able to actually um, shift and move and for the venue design to be innovative. Uh, uh, and then operationally functional. So the venue has to operate well. You have to be able to get in and out of it easily move around it easily, and promoters and venue hirers need to be able to pack in and out. It's a fundamental part of a successful venue is how quickly uh, events can get in and out and, and move on. The guest experience, so fundamental is the guest experience. A lot of that is an outcome of operational functionality, um, but good access to amenities, plenty of amenities, good food and beverage, um, and good um, variety of food and beverage as well. Uh, great acoustics, great seat comfort, good sight lines, all of those things that we've got a wonderful opportunity in designing this venue from the outset. 
and multi-use. Again, this venue needs to be multi-use. It's not just about sporting events. So large concerts, small concerts, flat floor events, you think about expos on the concourse, small and large events in the function areas and on the terraces. Uh, so the venue needs to be able to deliver all of those things for the city. Revenue stream. So the baseline investment case talks about the type of events and the variety of events and the volume of those events. And you'll see there, that's a recap on what, what were the baseline uh, investment case numbers and the, those revenue streams. So you think about commercial naming rights, ticketing partnerships, forage partnerships, signage, membership, advertising. There's, there's plenty of opportunity uh, uh, in those baseline reven revenue streams, but also uh, in addition to. So now that we've recapped on what were the uh, intended outcomes, what is the preliminary design delivering? So prelim design is always going to still have a few work-ons. It's really natural uh, at this phase in design to, to have a few, a few work-ons. But the design is at a point where most of those things should be baked in. So we can confidently say that the commercial viability outcomes will be met. The design enables a good variety of events, um, and uh, all of those baseline investment types is detailed in the investment case. But it also enables future prepping. So it enables the delivery of things like eSports, which is the fastest growing sport in the world, digital billboards, external signage, and broader activation of the public realm. Uh, it also enables future tenancies. So there are a number of areas that remain, uh, shell and core areas that remain able to be tenanted in the future, which is another uh, revenue stream. Operational functionality. So the prelim design allows for good egress and ingress, smooth um, uh, movement around the venue, and really good pack in and out for venue hirers, particularly that northern stage pocket is a fantastic outcome. Uh, and it also allows for some future proofing. There's space in there for a second goods lift, which means that things can move around the venue more easily. Uh, another design fundamental is turf health, absolutely fundamental to the success of the venue. Uh, the design uh, delivers a rectangle field of play, obviously, uh, with natural turf. Uh, and uh, all of those things that need to be worked on to make sure that there's plenty of light, plenty of ventilation uh, in a venue with a roof are obviously uh, complicated, um, but uh, the design is certainly at a point in time where that is enabled. The guest experience, so again, the guest experience is well and truly delivered with the current design. Um, the seat sizes are of an industry best standard, the sight lines similarly. There's really good quality acoustics for cut down concerts and sporting events. The accessibility standards are of New Zealand building code standards uh, and there's a good number of suitably located food and beverage outlets as well. Uh, and there are future-proofing opportunities for guest experience as well. So thematic lighting is something that we could put in at a later date, uh, as well, the, well as building our additional weather protection outside the venue for an enhanced guest experience. Sustainability, again, another design fundamental. Um, the design well and truly enables good operational sustainable practices and incorporates good sustainable design practices. Uh, the design delivers an all-electric energy solution. So there are no fossil fu fuels used in the um, operation of the facility itself. Um, and there are future-proofing opportunities also. The structure is being built in a way that will enable solar panels at a point in time, if not from the outset, uh, and also a move to a fully reusable waste strategy. Um, all right, so that's a revisit on the, uh, on the design fundamentals. And then just moving on to the name of the venue. So as we all know, the, the CMUA is really symbolic of post-earthquake recovery. It's the last of the anchor projects. It's a symbol of what has some, something that has really bonded the people of our community together. Uh, it's a highlight of that strength, that endurance, that resilience that has been so apparent in our community to date. Um, we have already been, well, the venue has already been gifted the name Tikaharoa, which is strength and endurance, and that is the name of the precinct. But the name CMUA has worked to date because it reflects exactly what the venue is, which is a genuine multi-use arena, but it isn't necessarily a name that resonates. Uh, and so now we're, we're um, 
then asked to accept the name Takaha. Takaha again means strength, and it is a name that could carry, if it remains with the venue forever, that real symbol of enduring strength, and it could be reflected in the name forever, uh, which I believe is a really powerful thing. Um, I think it's a name that will connect with our community uh, and is something that, um, in all fairness, it's easy to say it's something that um, kia kaha was, a, was again another, another phrase that was used a lot actually post-earthquake and as I said the other day, not to labour the point, but it really is a, an important um, symbol of, um, of what everyone has been through. And I think that's me. So uh, thank you, and uh, as I said before, uh, we're at the prelim design uh, phase. Um, we've presented a lot of information to support the resolution. We've had some really good feedback that we're taking through to the uh, developed design phase. There is a lot of uh, stakeholder consultation required during that period. We'll be back uh, with a, our quarterly update under the Statement of Intent in March. Uh, we have another comprehensive update in April or when we get to the developed design phase and then on to a key decision uh, for the design and construction contract uh, in June. Uh, thank you, happy to take questions. Thanks very much for that and I, I, I'd also like to acknowledge staff that turned around a, a split between the two papers so that we have a public facing debate with all of the confidential stuff held in, um, in, in the place where it ought to be. Uh, while contractual arrangements are entered into. Um, so um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Yanni? Um, are you able just to go through and just help highlight what the opportunities are for public consultation on the design and on any sort of future budgets? Um, so on. I can probably touch on engagement around design. Um, I guess... Um, there's been plenty of stakeholder engagement, particularly from venue users uh, around the design to date. As we move into developed design, that's the opportunity to now engage, even particularly around cultural narrative, uh, the Pacifica community, how we can actually build some of those design elements into the interior and exterior design. And that's something that can happen in developed design. And so we've identified a range of all of those stakeholders and we'll be mapping out those engagement points over the next a uh, couple of weeks that will actually map out the next couple of years. Um, Sorry, but I really was just trying to understand. I appreciate the stakeholders. I'm more interested in the general community. Like we had a huge number of people that um, signed a petition that obviously have an interest in it. What is the opportunity for a general public consultation engagement through this process? Um, so we need to take some guidance from council on a, uh, how we would uh, go forward with that. We, we are receiving a lot of feedback through community channels and through the um, the key stakeholders that have been identified as the major stakeholders to engage with. So we're receiving a lot of that community feedback through them. But if you want us to undertake a separate process to that, um, you need to advise us that that's what you want us to do. Yeah, I, I, well, it's not, it's not something that we're considering today. I mean, this is the preliminary design which needs to be adopted and then we move on to the next phase. Um, I'm really satisfied with the list of stakeholders and the fact that you're very open um, to getting feedback from um, you know, the people who ultimately are going to be the, the end users of um, this amazing facility. You know, and I kind of, I really like the, the, the name. It's, it's, it's um, you know, that strength that sits in behind it. It's really good. So can I just, I had several other questions. Um, just wanted to understand, um, in terms of uh, the feedback that we've given, there's been some discussion about toilets. Um, you know, I've put a question around family rooms, for example. Mm -hmm. all, all those sort of little things, are, are they able, they'll be incorporated as we go through the next phase and so we'll get answers to what what's possible. I know, that, for example, there was a lot of concern around the traffic assessment, around the number of people using Ubers or taxis compared to what we were presented with. Yep, so two, two responses. We've had a number of questions and we'll provide comprehensive feedback on all of those questions. Uh, and throughout this period from now through to April, uh, we'll be engaging with the stakeholders on those issues and we will make another comprehensive presentation on, on all of those matters when we present the developed design. 
Right. Okay. And just the final, final question for, um, I guess it's more of our staff, is if we do have to add additional money to the budget, at what point do we have an understanding about the level of consultation that's required? Does somebody... Alan? Oh, so, so I'm just, and if we do have to add additional money to the budget that's currently not on budget, at what point do we get an understanding of what consultation will have to occur with our community? Um, as I mentioned before, um, we will need to come back to you on that response. We, will, we are currently reviewing that and seeing what impact that has. And we will make sure that that is in plenty of time for you to be able to undertake any consultation that we are recommending to you anywhere near before you sign any contract. Right. Okay. Um, I've got Pauline and then Mike. Oh, thank you. Um, my question's around the accessibility features, um, which do have to be put into the very, very preliminary design because often there are bigger doorways and openings, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, but you mentioned that we're using the New Zealand Building Code Accessibility Guide. Is that the best practice one in the world, or could we be using a higher standard? Alistair. Yeah. Um, we've, we've presented a couple of times, and, uh, and Gilbert Gervais is the technical director for B6 Watt Packs, uh, stood up and said uh, on numerous occasions that we're, we're designing to a standard because we have to meet a standard. That's the consent yeah. obligations that we've got to meet. We are where we can uh, going another step um, and, and part and parcel of our engagement with council has been through the accessibility working group and we took a lot of great feedback from that working group but also I, I believe the feedback we received was that we had already included multiple areas and also seating positions and what, 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 what accessibility requirements we put within the design exceeded some of the people around that table, the, the, the expectation from the people in the room. So the intention from the feedback we've received today is that we attend more of those groups, uh, the accessibility working group in particular, the sustainability committee. We want to go. We want to start providing and provisioning that information across the board in council, and it's part of the objectives that we've got now through the board that the board want to be uh, open to what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we're doing and what more can we learn and what more can we adopt. I believe at the moment we've got a really good structure under the preliminary design that incorporates a lot of those aspects, but there's always tweaks that we can make, and that's why doing this now, accepting the preliminary design, working into developed design, taking on board all of that information can be absorbed into the current design team. Great, so. that's, thank you, that's encouraging. And my other question is that, um, you know, I'm finding this building a lot more imposing and big than I anticipated it would be. Um, if we hadn't increased the seating numbers would that would it have been lower uh it would have yes it, yeah ultimately would shrink slightly but not mass, not massively if you know what i mean it's uh it still has to it, it's the minimum height to kick from the field of play to the underside of the truss is still 32 meters you still need that and, and unfortunately the design height of the truss itself is around 15 meters so you know, you're still going to have whatever the width of it, you've still got to deal with it through the structure. So you've still got to meet that 32, mil, 32 meter mark for right. the kicking, but you also need the, the depth of the truss might have slightly changed based on the uh, pitch that we had on the side. So it's, it's structural engineering 101 really, but it's, uh, yeah. Have truss, we sort of truss truss submerging to be it into the ground a bit like you do with your swimming pool? Well, we can't because of uh, floodplain management, so we uh, <laughs> we actually have to come out of the ground, So, and we are coming out of the ground. Thank you. Um, Mike? Thank you. Th thanks for the presentation. Um, in terms of the sustainability aspect of it, this seems to be the main focus is around the operational performance, and I'm just wondering about the actual build of the structure itself um, and the sustainability aspect of, of that. And, example of the materials yeah so so you know, ultimately um, it's a steel frame skeletal frame which is uh, is substantial in its own size for the for what we're trying to achieve as a as a, an arena um, obviously we've got concrete bleachers uh, that are required for the seating and uh, we've got a plastic ETFE roof because of weight loading to the roof itself so Yes, we appreciate that the, those uh, three products alone are, are not the greatest products in the world, but uh, from, a, from a stadia design principles, um, 
they are products that are used around the world. What the team are doing through the interiors, if you will, is what other products can we bring in that mitigate some of those uh, those long, you know, the sustainability issues that we've got. So right across the board, there's a list of things that we're working towards and trying to attain, and we are attaining a lot of those through that design. Um, but again, we're at preliminary design, we're moving into developed design, and that's really the big phase where we've got the structure, we've got the superstructure in place, we've got the field of play, we've got a design that's uh, truly understood by the engineers. Now we're into the level of detail, and that comes from the developed design phase. And we, we've taken on board every comment that's been made regarding sustainability, and it is a key objective of the board and the project design team to ensure that we meet those needs. Okay. Well, um, Phil? Happy to move. Do I have a seconder for that? Aaron? Debate. Is there any debate? Jimmy Chen. Uh, yes, yeah, this is uh, uh, the last and uh, most uh, the important uh, iconic uh, the facility after earthquake. Because after earthquake, after now almost uh, 10 years, so the uh, community, residents, repair, all concerned uh, this one. But today's briefing also, uh, Tuesday briefing, that's uh, a comprehensive uh, is the report. You know? so, Thanks for the similar the, all those the team you know, done the greater job. So I support this one. I support the reason is uh, because the particular emphasis uh, these uh, are the kind of the the uh, preliminary design uh, totally is follow you know to match the principle of the previous uh, concept design. Then after that is the developing the uh, design and uh, for the. Uh, detailed design to put on the uh, construction. So we heard uh, those uh, comprehensive report, you know. It's very, very, very uh, uh, impressed with the list uh, report. You know? um, but the, I'm uh, concerned is uh, uh, we still need to improve those uh, engagement. Because on Tuesday, the briefing, uh, uh, based on the presentation, particular emphasis, uh, the uh, stakeholders' uh, engagement strategy the, to be the developing. If we develop this one, but if we review the current, the, the, all those the, uh, the stakeholders, I, my personal view, still not yet you know, to cover a wide range of the, the key community, and also have not yet uh, totally compliant, consistent with the council's the, uh, strategic direction, also some of the strategic document. For instance, on our uh, strategic uh, direction, we have value, voices, older cultures, and ages, particular young people, different ethnic group, even the children. Second one is uh, based on the multicultural the strategy. We are all aware a moment in our city, 25% uh, was born outside of the Christchurch, even outside of New Zealand. They are equally to access the council's resources and also the service, as well as participating in the decision-making process. So I do hope all those the, uh, the engagement strategy when be developed can consider cover all those people to make the this this facility to be uh, heard, welcome to be used and fit for the older people's the, the, the purpose. This is my, my recommendation. But generally speaking, I totally support this one. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to quickly say a um, couple of thank yous to all the team involved when, in your presentations recently, uh, bringing us on board and, and walking us through, going through all of those multiples of questions and I think the public should have a lot of confidence in the amount of questions that are being asked by everyone at this table. Uh, I think everyone's been really engaged and, and that's important. Um, Alistair, I know you're leaving soon but uh, thanks very much um, from me, from the public and, uh, and no doubt most at this table and others will say it at other times but I just wanted to say it publicly. Uh, thank you. And uh, Barry, stepping up in the role you've taken, a lot of people in Christchurch might not know who you are. I've been lucky enough to work with you at DHB and see you come into this role and the leadership that you've brought should give the people of Canterbury and New Zealand a lot of confidence in this project 
uh, getting on track and being delivered. Uh, I'm not going to say anything else around the delivery, but being delivered to the expectations that the people are, are wanting. So thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Um, as a council, we've been very clear that sustainability needs to be a core part of uh, the arena's design. It is a functional and design requirement under the CML project brief and needs to be taken into account throughout the entire process. However, what I have seen is a sustainability is an add-on, a nice to have in a business as usual 20th century stadium with a few high-tech options. What we're after is a 21st century stadium, a green stadium designed with the climate crisis in mind. It is concerning to me that sustainability outcomes are seen as reputational rather than environmental. Unlike most buildings, around three quarters of the lifetime carbon impact of any stadium comes from its building materials, while the opposite is true for residential and business buildings, where the three quarters of the lifetime carbon impact comes from the operation of the building. That means the structure and design of the arena needs to be addressed now. I'm currently not happy with where this is at, at a sustainability level, and still have concerns about where the costs are heading, although I do appreciate the mahi that has been done to control this. Apart from the gifting of the name Te Kaha, I'll be voting against the resolutions today. However, it is my hope when the developed design comes back to us in the mid-year, I'll be able to support it. Thank you. Um, uh, Melanie? I just wanted to say I'm becoming increasingly, con increasingly concerned about the financial implications of this build, so um, I'm going to abstain. Uh, Pauline? Yeah, I'm a bit of the same mind as, as Melanie and, um, and Mike, Councillor Davidson, on this too. I'm very concerned about it. We've been um, told to build this. We've been told to build it where it's going. I, th I still think the location is wrong. And because of the, the, the huge imposition this is going to be on our city, it's going to create a lot of shade all around it and a lot of um, reverse sensitivity, shall we say. Um, so... I'm wondering, Leanne, if you could split one. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to put them separate. You know, but also one, I would like to support the continued developed design, but I don't support the design phase where it is now. Um, otherwise, I'll have to vote against all of one, and I'll and I'll support two. I'd like to I'd like to see the design work continue, but I don't support where it is now. But otherwise, I'll abstain, and I'll support two. Thank you. Is I am confused. One, there's two parts to, to one. Yes, I know, but until the preliminary design is accepted, then Kultui has no ability to continue on okay, the well, I, design yep. phase. All right, I'll so just it's abstain. Best to vote yep. against the whole thing or abstain. Abstain, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I don't need to speak for too long, but I think this is a really important step in the, in the continuation of CMUA uh, as we progress forward. I think what the public have said time and time again is they just want this built now. And so, you know, I think it's wonderful that we can have this in a public forum where you're given great confidence that actually this can be delivered. Now, there'll be things that work through, but, I mean, just remember back to uh, when we had everyone talking about the size of the stadium and the delivery, the key theme now is we need to get on and do it. So I do hope we have a majority support today to get that in motion. Um, I think it would be incredibly devastating for the city if we were to put another roadblock in the way of this. Um, you know, you can have disagreements over the size and the like, um, but we have already worked on early works and things like that, which people were supportive of. Uh, so I think we do probably need to progress this today and, and just get on with it for the city. It's the last step, um, and I think it would be foolish if we weren't to acknowledge just the, the point in time we're at, knowing that the team are continuing to do really good work to drive value within it uh, to deliver something that's going to be wonderful for our city. So I do hope everyone supports it. Uh, kia ora, yeah, I totally agree with Sam. I think this is the time to actually keep moving forward. This is a time when our community needs uh, hope and uh, things to look forward to. This is actually uh, acknowledging the huge emotional investment that our community has in this project. Really want to thank the team. And to actually sort of not progress it would be really disrespectful for the work that has already been done. So um, I will be supportive of this today. Um, 
I mean, I wasn't here for the initial vote, but I think it's fair to say that we have to remove politics from the decision and consider if it's the design is where it stands at the moment is fit for purpose and it caters to all members of our community. And we also need to consider if it takes into account our commitment to future generations. At the moment, there is a strong temptation to make politically popular decisions in the short term without consideration of the longer term implications. This isn't a minor decision, and I note that those who voted against removing library fines with the need to exercise caution now want to go ahead without similar due diligence when it comes to this particular decision. Christchurch deserves a world-leading design, and we deserve something that's unique and not a replica of other stadiums that we are now in competition with. The trend towards international trend is towards mid-size, multi-use arenas that are agile and have lower operating costs. The focus on quality design with a unique value proposition, which also takes into account the future needs of communities that will be using this. So we have to build for the future, and that includes focusing on sustainability and lower carbon emissions. We're advised that the design stage of this project will include further opportunities to investigate, demonstrate climate change leadership and resilience, yet it doesn't appear that the design concept, this um, feature has been prioritised, the design fundamentals, and instead we're focusing on building a large stadium that is effectively a replica of other stadiums around the country. And my concern is the decision to add solar panels at a future point in time suggests this is feature as an afterthought and we're paying lip service to what should be a core design principle. The other factor is the cost escalation. We've heard a lot about the impacts of COVID and the rates impact. So we need to weigh up the economic benefits of the current proposal against a realistic understanding of the risks and the unbudgeted cost escalation, which we know is significant. We've heard a lot about the economic opportunities, but we haven't heard much about the loss opportunities, which a longer term investment in other areas um, might yield if we were to invest some of these funds in things such as climate change. So I will be voting against this. Um, thank you. Look, um, this is going to be the cutting edge stadium in New Zealand. And keeping in mind, it's going to be the cheapest because the government is giving us $220 million to complete this. It will be, for the ratepayers, the cheapest and the most advanced stadium in this country for the next 15 to 20 years, which is outstanding. And just a couple of other things. Prior to the earthquake, the council's own company, which ran these um, Lancaster Park, etc., was the single largest employer of temporary employment for students in the South Island and many others that are involved in the industry. It is actually eco economically important. Following the global financial crisis, when I was in the game of delivering large concerts for promoters and the public, etc., following the global financial crisis, we had a raft of entertainers coming and needing to tour because a lot of the um, entertainers don't own the licence for the, their um, music. They don't earn money from their licences. They have to tour and make money from ticket sales and um, sale of merchandise. So after the global financial crisis, we were all worried and suddenly we had this tsunami. And I believe that that will actually be in line with the opening of this wonderful stadium because um, historically viruses run for a seven year cycle. We know, don't know what this will be, but if you look at other viruses and, and what, how they've run, this could actually tie in with that. So there are some really good opportunities here. So I, I think we, a lot of us aren't looking at the big picture and that's what we have to do. Thank you. Right. Okay, well, um, Phil, would you like to close the debate? Oh, <laughs> sorry? Did you have your hand up? Sorry, I didn't see you. must have been behind Andrew's head. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think what this um, report shows and this design shows that fundamentally we've chosen the wrong location. We should have built back at Lancaster Park. Um, and interestingly enough, it's now come out that the land conditions here are... are not very good um, and this is like a similar thing that we've seen with 
Kiwi 2 being moved into the central city. Um, and a number of these anchor projects coming from areas which really valued them and gave an identity have now ended up in sites where we were told they had to be moved because the land condition was so poor that actually the land condition has been at least no better, if not worse than where they previously were. So this whole idea, I think, as a council of supersizing everything in our central city um, has been the wrong approach. And I think you know, what, what we fundamentally see is that the costs have gone through the roof, the cost of acquiring private property to put public facilities and then deal with the ground conditions and to deal with the, um, the cost of and the time factor of being able to get on and do it has, has been significant and, and quite frankly horrendous. Um, what's really clear about this design is the imposing structure that it will have on the local neighbourhood, especially where we're trying to encourage people to come and live in the inner city. But also, um, if you read the traffic assessment, I think what's really clear is that from a traffic uh, uh, assessment, um, there's a number of limitations around um, how people will get to and from this space. Um, it is located close to the bus exchange, but when you think about places like Manchester Street um, and the ability for that just to be completely gridlocked now without this massive um, facility going in, then I think you start to see that there'll be a lot of issues um, when this goes ahead. But I think we've, we've sort of passed the point of having a discussion around the location. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think we do need transparency around the cost. And I do think we do need to um, engage with our community over um, what is probably the most expensive structure we will, we will build as a council, um, at least um, this decade, possibly for several future decades. And I am worried about the sustainability issues that have been raised as well, where it does seem like sustainability is the first thing that gets cut to value manage, rather than the thing that's put in as a core principle of um, the design. I hope as part of the developed design that those things can be picked up, because I think the other thing that's disappointing about this design is it doesn't activate any of the edges that relate back into the central city. Sarah? Just really briefly, um, I've always been clear that I'm in favour of having a stadium and the site is the right one. It's 400 metres from the bus exchange. But I'm in favour of the arena in the approved investment case and the staff recommended one. And this arena has increased the financial risk to ratepayers beyond what's acceptable. And for all the reasons I expressed in August, I'll be voting against all but the name this time too. Um, just, uh, I, I just want to not enter the debate, but before I invite Phil to close the debate, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Alistair Pearson and thank you for your service to the council. Um, I think this will be the last uh, formal time that you'll appear in front of us. And um, I wanted to publicly acknowledge it, that there's an enormous um, level of confidence in the um, support and advice that you have been able to bring to major projects in the city. And I think the city has been well served by you. So I just wanted to acknowledge you. Thank you very much. And now I'll hand it over to you, Phil, to close the debate. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we're, we're very lucky to have had Alistair all the way through here, uh, along with a lot of others. But we have now got a fantastic team of people, designers over in Australia. Sadly, they, they talked to us on Zoom the other day. Um, I agree with um, Tim. We're very lucky that the government have given us 220 mil. But even prior to that, the previous government bought a lot of that land and then gave it to us for not much. So we, if you add it all up, we're going to get a, a world-class stadium for about half cost because a lot of it's it's like it's like winning lotto and we've we've got half of it for nothing. So I can't wait to get this underway, and uh, I encourage everyone to. Uh, Please um, vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. So I will put number one by itself. So um, uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. So is it easy? Could we have a division, please? Yeah, OK, that's fine. Division. Um, Yes. Councillor McDonald? Yes. Councillor Yellington? Yes. 
Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Donovan? No. Councillor Coker? Abstain. Councillor Tim? Yes. The Mayor? Yes. Councillor Stendrich? Yes. Councillor Major? Yes. Councillor Kewan? Yes. Councillor Goff? Yes. Councillor Davidson? Go. No. Councillor Cotter? Abstain. Councillor Chu? Yes. Deputy Mayor? Yes. Three votes for three votes against and three abstentions. That's uh, declared carried, and I will move now to items two and three. Um, uh, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed? Sorry? So you don't want that, you want the commercially sensitive material. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll put them all together. Yeah. Right. I'll put the motion. That's two and three. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move that we. Um, oh no, we don't need to move that we come out of PX. Um, I just. It's twelve fifty-six. So there are a couple of other items that we can um, deal with. Thank you very much.